Well, thank you, Chet. Uh, it's really an incredible honor to pay homage to Roscoe and to follow in the footsteps of all the people who have uh, been awarded this uh, wonderful um, award in the past and all the work that they've done. It's been really important for the field. So today I'm going to tell you about a couple of things, cystinosis and the undiagnosed disease program. And this started in 1981 when I came to the NIH. <clears throat> and you'll notice here my boss, Joe Shulman, and then uh, Nava Bashan, who is a scientist from Israel. And then uh, to my left is Frank Tietz, who's a world-famous sulfur chemist. And I think you'll notice that there's only one person in this group that actually reads Gentleman's Quarterly. I had on the plaid shirt that was popular in those days, along with the uh, two breast pockets and uh, the uh, pen protector and the note cards. Um, neither of the others actually cared about those things. Okay, so I'm going to talk about nephropathic cystinosis, <clears throat> and this is a recessive disorder. It's quite uncommon. Lysosomal storage disease, in a time when lysosomal storage diseases were essentially enzyme defects with storage of large molecules, this is a small molecule that's stored, and because of its insolubility, <clears throat> it crystallizes. And uh, <clears throat> the defect was unknown at the time, but the kids would die of renal failure about age 10, and the replacement was, uh, the uh, treatment was solely symptomatic, the re replacement of uh, renal losses, et cetera. I'm going to turn on the pen a little bit here, and then the laser pointer. <clears throat> As for many lysosomal storage diseases, <clears throat> patients were normal at birth, but then developed problems, in this case, in the first year of life. Renal tubular Franconi syndrome caused them to lose small molecules, including phosphate, so they had rickets, they had poor growth. In early childhood, uh, the crystals in the cornea caused them photophobia, and then they would die of glomerular failure at age 9 or 10 on average. <clears throat> then there were some late complications once transplants occurred, and the first transplant was in 1968. These are the crystals in the bone marrow, and the liver, and the kidney, and this is a, um, an EM showing the crystals in the lysosome here, and the scanning EM by Dr. Ishak showed the crystals protruding from the lysosomes of the cell. Now, as a young investigator, I was interested in the genesis of cystine itself. So I actually came across Michelangelo's painting, The Creation of Adam, <clears throat> and looked more closely at it, and I found that actually this was a painting demonstrating the conferring of the molecule cystine from God to man. And the painting is actually meant to be the creation of atoms, not the creation of Adam. <clears throat> and I think that you'll probably recognize that this is a painting that's uh, on the ceiling of a chapel that was, as I recall, uh, named after this molecule. Maybe it's the delivery, I'm not sure. But, um, at the time, <clears throat> it was suspected that this might be a transport defect because it was a small molecule, but there was no evidence for that. And there's a real problem. You have a huge amount of cystine in the uh, mutant cells <clears throat> and none in the normal cells, roughly speaking. How can you measure the relative rates of cystine egress unless you're able to load the normal cells with uh, a commensurate amount of cystine? And that was actually solved by Fr uh, Frank Tietz. <clears throat> and it was through taking amino acid methyl esters, which basically cover the carboxyl group and are able to penetrate membranes, including the lysosomal membranes. Then they're cleaved by the acid hydrolases to yield the free amino acids. In fact, you can take leucine and give a certain concentration of leucine, probably about 10 millimolar, and expose cells to them, and it'll lyse all of the lysosomes because it's clipped so rapidly and uh, egress so slowly uh, in relatively. So anyway, that's a way to load the normal lysosomes. And this is the cystine dimethyl ester, uh, where you take off this and this to the hydrolases. So our plan, or the, the work that I did, was to expose the polymorphonuclear leukocytes to cystine dimethyl ester, then wash it away, break open the cells, centrifuge to separate <clears throat> the uh, granular fraction, which contains the lysosomes, and then incubate at 37 degrees, remove the uh, aliquots of it, and then separate the lysosomes from outside the lysosomes. 
So the supernatant uh, and the pellet. And when we did that, we found that the amount of cystine outside was increasing as a function of time, and the amount inside was decreasing as a function of time, the total stayed the same. This outside cystine reflects an initial velocity of cystine egress. And if you measure that velocity as a function of a lysosome, namely a unit of hexosaminidase, you now have a velocity, an actually initial velocity, and you have a loading, or um, in enzymology, this would be a substrate concentration, but it's really a loading concentration. And uh, the velocity increases as a function of loading linearly and then levels off. This is saturation kinetics. It proves that there's a carrier. Cystin cystinotics had none, and heterozygotes had half as much dosage effect because remember the Vmax in Michaelis Menten kinetics is a measure of the number of uh, porters. Then there's this uh, issue of countertransport. If you have an empty lysosome, let's say, and you put tracer amounts of tritiated cystine outside, there's a certain amount that will go in. If you load that with cold cystine, there, how, how much do you think is going to go in, more or less? Well, intuitively, you'd think that less would go in because there's already a lot in there. But in fact, after a period of time, there's a lot more that goes in if there's a carrier. The reason being that all of the cold cystine prevents egress. And, and so there's the same amount of tritiated cystine that goes in, but none ever goes out because it's competed against by the cold cystine. <clears throat> and that can only occur if there's a carrier. Well, if there's countertransport, then there's a carrier and there's countertransport. These are the non-loaded normal lysosomes. These are the cold cystine loaded normal lysosomes. Not only that, but the cystinotics had zero uh, countertransport, uh, indicating, again, not only that uh, there's a carrier, but that the carrier is deficient in cystinosis. So we knew those things, and this defined the defect uh, in cystinosis as a transport defect with heterozygotes having half the maximal velocity and the cystinosin um, protein was uh, defined only 15 years later when the gene CTNS was cloned. Now, just Tenney uh, at Michigan championed the use of cysteamine, this molecule to treat cystinosis. Cysteamine, because of its amine group, is able to pass through membranes, including the lysosomal membrane, and then the amine group is charged, and it's trapped in the lysosome because of the acidity. And it interacts with cysteine right here in a disulfide interchange reaction to produce cysteine, which can freely leave the lysosome, while cysteine can't, and cysteine cysteamine mixed disulfide, which can also leave the lysosome, in this case, by a lysine transporter that is uh, normal in cystinotics. So there was a study done between 1978 and 1985 that was actually an international study published in the New England Journal. But there was a second study that was published in 1992 by Tom Markello in the New England Journal, and uh, that was an intent to treat study. And this is what got cysteamine approved by the Food and Drug Administration. He looked at every patient that was seen at the NIH between 1960 and 1992 and divided them up into those that received no cysteamine, partial cysteamine, and then really excellent cysteamine, meaning that the white blood cell cysteine had been lowered uh, really significantly and the patient had started before age two. And then he measured the creatinine clearance. And because we have inpatients with cystinosis, we collect 24-hour urine. So he used the 24-hour urine creatinine clearance and he looked over 2,025 patients. That's Tom. Well, it turns out that <clears throat> normals, no, in, that, in other words, not having cystinosis, will increase their creatinine clearance in the first three years of life because their kidneys are growing. If you have no cystamine and you've got cystinosis, you have a monoclonic decline in your creatinine clearance, your renal function, till age 10 or so, at which time you need a kidney transplant. If you're treated with cystamine in a fine fashion, you not only don't have that decline, you actually have an increase because you're able to preserve the growth of the glomeruli in the first three years of life. And in fact, every month in the first three years of life that you start cystamine early, telescopes to 14 months of preservation of renal glomerular function. Important to start early, and that's why my last line on cystinosis has to do with newborn screening. Anyway, this was approved in 1994. 
and it helps maintain kidney function. It enhances growth, probably about six months after starting this, along with good calories and phosphate re repletion. You're able to start uh, growing at a normal rate. There's no catch-up growth attendant to sustaining, but you can give growth hormone and prevents the late complications. These are some of the late complications that I uh, really will not go into. Well, what about the eyes? The corneas are, have the, these crystals in them. Wouldn't it be incredible to dissolve the crystals? <laughs> it turns out you can do it. It's almost miraculous. I'm not sure I actually believed it was going to happen. But Dr. Kaiser championed that. <clears throat> and of course, the reason they're not dissolved by oral sustaining is because the uh, cornea is not vascular. But if you can put eye drops in, you can really help these individuals. And we had a team there working on this. After about uh, maybe a year or so, you can take a, an untreated eye like this and dissolve the crystals and make the haziness go away. The photophobia goes away even sooner than that. So cystinosis is a lysosomal disorder that was associated with certain death in the 50s, almost certain death in the 60s. Uh, a transplant could be uh, obtained in the late 60s. And then late complications, and until sustaining came along, you had those complications with a delay in renal transplant, but still requiring a renal transplant. Today, some of our patients need a transplant at age uh, 18 or 20, some of them at age 30 or 35. The trouble is that the damage is significant by the time a patient is diagnosed at an average age of 14 months. They've maybe lost 30 or, or even more percent of their uh, creatinine clearance. So newborn screening is important, and newborn screening has been demonstrated in Germany. This fellow has cystinosis. He's now growing up to be a cowboy. Actually, he's not a cowboy, but at the time he was. <laughs> and these two women have cystinosis. They look pretty good. And this is a baby of one of those kids, of those, one of those women. Wow. Uh, after that, we recognized that a sialic acid might also be something that's transported by a transporter in the lysosomal membrane and may be stored there in a disease called Sala disease, named after a region of northern Finland. And we actually demonstrated with Martin Renlin and Riley Seppala, who came to my laboratory, that free sialic acid was not transported out in Sala disease. And after that, uh, Marianne Hoising, who's in the audience here, um, followed up on uh, disorders of sialic acid metabolism and is championing that, including free sialic acid storage disorders, uh, which she renamed as a disease and changed the nomenclature and established a consortium for the study of that. In 2008, we started the Undiagnosed Diseases Program in the intramural program of the NIH to discover new diseases, new mechanisms, new pathways, new cell biology, but mainly to help patients come to a diagnosis when they didn't have one. And Dr. Tift, who's in the audience here, and you all know her from her GM1 work, is the director of the pediatric portion. Uh, David Adams does the bioinformatics. Uh, Camilo Toro and uh, Maria Acosta are neurologists. She's in the audience as well. We have an internist and uh, a director of translational medicine and a lot of help from a lot of people around the uh, intramural NIH. So we receive the medical records of the patients and then uh, a referring letter from the physician. And I triage for the adults, and Dr. Tiff does for the kids. We send them out to some of our consultants intramurally and uh, turn down about two-thirds of the patients and accept about a third. And those we see for one week as inpatients where we can get anything we want done because we don't have to get third-party insurance to pay for it. I've seen over 5,000 medical records, 1,500 patients have come for that week stay. A lot of children, more than 50% neurology, made 360, maybe more now, uh, diagnoses, and a lot of publicity and publications. These are the new disease associations that we've made, so, and, and actually there are a few more. It's a little bit outdated, okay. And this has been expanded to a national network in 2013 with six extramural sites, and then in 2018 with 11 extramural sites, and now a worldwide organization called the Undiagnosed Disease Network International with undiagnosed disease programs throughout the world. And we meet, we've met 11 times since 2014. Now I want to tell you about one patient, actually two patients, an 18-month-old female who had failure to thrive 
problems with her intestine and uh, hypopigmentation, an important issue. Hepatosplenomegaly, so big organs and storage in those organs, as uh, to suggest the lysosomal storage disease. No osteopetrosis. I'll tell you why that's important. Here's the young lady and the delayed myelination. Interesting, she has pigment in her iris. It's very unusual to have pigment in your um, eyes and not in your skin and hair. Here are the storage indications, etc. Foaminess in the uh, fibroblasts. Second patient was found. Also hypopigmentation, no osteopetrosis, storage, delayed myelination. Here's the little boy, and here's the demyelination, and here's the storage in different tissues and the, the fibroblast vacuoles. <clears throat> An exome analysis indicated a de novo mu mutation in CLCN7. So why is that important? Because when the proton pump puts protons and acidifies the lysosome, it builds up an electrochemical charge on the inside of the lysosomal membrane. And in order to dissipate that and get more acidity, you need to have chloride as a counter ion. If you don't have that, you can't acidify. And if you don't have that and you can't acidify, you get osteopetrosis because you need acidification of the osteoclastic lakes to destroy the old bone. So if you have loss of function mutations, you'll have osteopetrosis. Well, this patient had a different mutation which turns out to be a gain of function mutation. And that was demonstrated by Joe Mendel and NINDS. He took xenoposoocytes and <clears throat> in, um, in put the normal CLCN7 in and got a current for chloride transport across the oocytes. Then he put in the mutant and he got a much greater current. You can see that here. In addition, the pH was less. So this um, mutant was allowing for more chloride to go in and therefore more acidification. And so while in a mutant case where you have loss of function, you had decreased acidification, in this case there's more acidification and he demonstrated that. Furthermore, this was a gain of function and it was dominant. He proved that by taking normal cells <clears throat> and transfecting with the mutant CLCN7 and finding the vacuoles. So it didn't matter that you had two normal CLCN7s. If you put in the abnormal CLCN7, you're going to get those vacuoles. <clears throat> uh, created a mouse. Uh, Ralu, Nikolai, and May Malikan created the mouse. You can see it's hypopigmented. It's got vacuoles, et cetera. And the liver pathology of the mouse showed the accumulation here within the um, lysosomes and storage. Now, uh, we all know because we all study lysosomes, <laughs> that chloroquine alkalinizes lysosomes and actually endosomes. So if you increase the uh, chloroquine concentration and measure the lysosomal, lysos lysotracker red, which is a measure of uh, acidification, you'll see that the uh, acidification goes down, the uh, acidity goes down. And actually, uh, you can demonstrate that too. At different chloroquine concentrations, the pH goes up. So you're able to alkalinize. So the physician of the second patient that I showed you, Dr. Deborah De Salvatore, who studies lysosomal storage diseases and is really a great physician in New Brunswick, wrote a protocol treated with chloroquine and uh, had a clinical improvement and a biochemical improvement. The chitotriosidase fell by 26%. Kidney size went down. The patient was able to do things physically that he could not do previously. He subsequently, however, deteriorated and so did the other patient. Both of them died. However, we know of two or three new patients who are actually a little bit milder but have the same uh, gain of function defect in CLCN7. So there's hope in the future to treat uh, this patient. The final thing that I'd like to mention is that in our undiagnosed disease program, we see such unusual and odd cases, and we're able to bring them together um, in groups and, and study them because they're so uh, unique. And it turns out that many of them are lysosomal storage diseases that are milder and have later onset, found by our neurologists, uh, Maria and Camilo, etc. And one of our uh, staff clinicians, Cheng Rui, put together a list of 10 uh, UDN patients with late onset lysosomal storage diseases. They're listed here. 
They had neurocognitive defects. They had a mean age of eight years when they first started to have symptoms. Uh, but their diagnosis was 25 years later or, or, or so. And what this indicates to us is how important it is, especially for neurologists, adult neurologists, to recognize pediatric neurological diseases, especially lysosomal storage diseases. And so that's uh, in the literature now and really should be proselytized among the adult neurological community. Uh, finally, I think that it can be said that our undiagnosed diseases program at the NIH and then nationally and now worldwide shares your world goal to lend a helping hand. Thank you very much.